Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Mike Simpson. Mike served over 30 years in the military as an Airborne Ranger, a Green Beret, and a Doctor of Emergency Medicine assigned to the Joint Special Operations Command. Mike was still running missions in Afghanistan with U.S. Special Forces when he was 48 years old. He now uses his extensive knowledge of training and medicine to help men over 40 achieve peak physical condition. He's the author of a new book, a brand new book called Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. So Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to this discussion, uh, being uh, 54 myself and uh, <laughs> trying to stay fit as a, as a business leader, an entrepreneur, and uh, trying to stay healthy and fit. It's always a challenge uh, as we get older. So I'm really interested in this topic, and I'm excited to get a chance to talk to you. And I know our listeners are going to enjoy it as well. So, but I wanted to get started a little bit real quick. I know you're seeing all the news mm -hmm. on TV with respect to Afghanistan and as being a war veteran yourself. Um, what are your observations about what's happening over there, especially from a leadership perspective? Uh, great question. And I, I think there's a, there's a lot of takeaways about leadership from this. And um, if I had to sum it up in one, just one is, you know, leaders ultimately have to take responsibility. The buck has to stop with, with a good leader and, you know, finger pointing, uh, I, ironically, one of the worst leaders, one of the worst commanders I ever had in the military, uh, had a very valuable saying, unfortunately, he never listened to it himself. Hmm. He said, you know, when you're pointing one finger at somebody, remember there's four fingers pointing back at you, but ironically, he was always the first person to blame others. So he didn't take his own advice, but, but that is a, that is a good saying. And, and I agree with it in spirit. Uh, yeah, the, the leadership problems uh, are many and we could do uh, we could do a whole three hour podcast just talking about that. But I think first and foremost, as a veteran, when I look at what's going on in Afghanistan and I look about, look at the, a uh, strategic leadership mistake. And if I had to boil it down to one pivotal thing, one thing, one that, that I think was the linchpin that that really caused everything else to unravel, that would be the way that we abandoned Bagram Airfield mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the night without a proper handover. The 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 best airhead that we had in the entire theater, that's where I flew in and out of Afghanistan on my tours. Uh, everybody pretty much has been through Bagram, so they're familiar with it. High capacity airfield uh, can, can take a high volume of traffic, much easier to secure. So the, the ancient city of Bagram, which surrounds it, is relatively tiny. I think that population, civilian-wise, swelled up to around 40,000 in the peak of, the, of our occupation there. But when you consider that Kabul is a city of four and a half million, so a larger population density than the city of Los Angeles. And to put this in perspective for anybody, non-Californians might have to look this up, but imagine, if you will, that uh, Afghanistan was the state of California and that we were running operations out of Edwards Air Force Base, which uh, uh, is about uh, twice as far away from Los Angeles as Bagram is from Kabul. And we said, wait, well, we know at some point we're going to have to evacuate 50,000 people out of Los Angeles, but we're just going to go ahead and do it out of LAX, and we're going to do it using one runway only, uh, and we're just going to set up a perimeter around that one runway, and we're going to evacuate 50,000 people from a city of, of 4 million, uh, and we're not even going to use Bagram, we're just going to, uh, we're not going to use Edwards Air Force Base, we're going to abandon it. And that's essentially what we did. Mm. What should have happened strategically is that Bagram should have been maintained and uh, we should have had a shuttle system both by, by land convoy and by aircraft. It's only 60 kilometers away. We could have been shuttling people there. There's plenty of room on Bagram that we could have had tent cities set up and processed everybody. So the vetting process wouldn't have been even, even have needed to happen on the ground. We just make sure people aren't getting on the plane with, uh, with a bomb vest or with weapons. We fly them to Bagram. And then at our leisure, do all of the, the vetting there. That's what should have happened. I know that's probably strategically a little bit more detailed answer than you were looking for, but yeah, yeah. I, I think the way this reflects back on leadership is I, I don't know what closed door conversations happened in the lead up to that, but it's the duty of military leaders, the duty of the leaders in the department of state and the, and in the, in the department of defense to step up and say, this is the strategically viable plan. This is what we need to do. 
And I don't know if that happened. And uh, General Milley, who uh, was the three corps commander on Fort Hood when I was stationed at Fort Hood, we know that he's no stranger to speaking his mind to the press when he disagrees with, uh, with politicians over him. And he certainly hasn't spoken out on you know, alternate plans that were briefed the, you know, the way that he wanted to do it. Um, so I do think we have a, a, a vacuum of leadership at the highest levels right now. And there was a, a Marine Corps lieutenant colonel recently spoke out about it and, and was relieved of his command because of it um, and is handling that as a professional, as a professional uh, military uh, officer and said, you know, yeah, I was relieved. And guess what? That's exactly what I would have done if somebody under my command spoke out in a similar fashion. But I felt that my obligation to speak out outweighed anything else. And that is leadership. Uh, yeah. it, plain and simple, that is leadership. And, and that's, yeah, I saw, we need I more people that, that are willing to step up. Yep. I thought, you know, he, he said, you know, he said his piece and then he ended up, there were consequences for that mm -hmm. and he accepted the consequences. But I think mm -hmm. what's sad is that he's now the only leader that's been fired over this whole situation, which, you know, is definitely tragic. Um, right. It's, you know, it's, it's sad to see after 20 years of, you know, work there to just sort of pull out in the middle of the night. So I think there's a lot of failures in leadership and I think there's some great, great things that are going to be looked at uh, for, for, from a leadership perspective. I think over time, but it's um, yeah, it's sad to see as a veteran, and you just feel for the the guys on the ground trying to uh, control the chaos at this point. The chaos was created by decisions up top. I mean, at the yeah. end of the day, so yeah, yeah, and and currently, I have I have friends on the ground there, both uh, both in and out of uniform, and the reports that I'm, that I'm getting back are that things are actually much worse than even mm. what we're seeing on the television, and the the, the feeling, the palpable feeling of desperation in the air constantly there 24 7 and and the the sort of damocles of this 31 august uh, deadline hanging over everyone's head which everyone agrees is completely impossible mm. to meet um it's going to be difficult it's going to be interesting i'm sure this will get studied and and needs to be studied and dissected going forward and mistakes made now need to be learned from, or we're, we're certainly going to repeat them again. Well, the good thing about the military, at least when I was in, is that we learn from our mistakes and we study them and we, we try to get better. And I, I, I can only hope that that happens in this case and uh, with, with our military commanders. And we look back and say, what did we do wrong strategically, tactically, you know, from a leadership perspective, there's so many things that seem to be wrong. Yeah. So yeah. It is, it's, it's hard to even think about it. So and thank you for, for, for helping us understand that a little bit better because you've definitely been there and you, you understand. So, yeah. well, let's switch gears to what we're here for, which is talk about the book and talk about what you're doing. I mean, the thing that got me when I first saw your, saw this material was you're 48 years old and you are um, doing operations with special forces in Afghanistan at 48 years old. As, as, a, as an older person myself, I realized Mm -hmm. Your body's not the same as when you're younger and you're in your, you're in your 20s and you're 18 to, you know, 25. So what's it like being an older member of the military, being someone that's uh, more seasoned, being around all these young people? What's that like? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly you have the, the value of your wisdom and experience, which is, which is great. You know, the thing, things that a younger guy might have to figure out or sweat his way through, um, are not stressful for you because you, you've been there, you've done that, and you have it figured out. But although uh, the spirit is willing, the, the flesh can sometimes be weak, and, and aging is a real thing. And, and yeah. my body at 48 years old, wearing full kit, uh, doing long distance movements on reverse cycle, working only at night, um, often, uh, often deprived of cal both caloric intake and sleep, uh, it was certainly difficult, and I certainly felt it uh, in in every part of my body, in every sense of the word. But the approach that I'd taken to physical fitness, knowing that maybe I can't do exactly the same things that I did when I was 21, when I was 31, even when I was 41, but I can still perform at a high level as long as I approach things using the wisdom that I've amassed over the years, knowing that this is you know this particular way might not be the right way to approach fitness. And, and I need to have more of an eye to, to longevity as opposed to 
uh, putting in a lot of work of very high intensity over a very short period of time, risking injury and mm-hmm. things of that nature. So it was definitely challenging, but it, at the same time, it was rewarding. And, you know, and I mentioned in the book that at 48 years old, I, I realized on that, that deployment that I was the same age my father had been when I was in th- that same Ranger Battalion. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and I thought to myself, what if somebody had said to, to me of that age, that time period as a young Ranger, hey, can you imagine your dad out here with us yeah. doing everything we're doing? I would have laughed. It just, yes, it would have yeah. been completely preposterous because to me, my, my dad was ancient, <laughs> right? Right. Even, you know, uh, the, the older NCOs in the company to me were probably in their thirties were extremely old, uh, to, to someone, to a ranger in his late teens and early twenties. So just even the concept of that was completely alien to me, but, uh, to be out there with, with those guys at, at, you know, 19 year old rangers and able to not only keep up but, you know, and, and bear my share of the load and, and pull security and be there as an asset, not a liability. Um, and also get looked to as an example by a lot of them. Hey, I can't, you know, Hey doc, it's, it's great. You know, that you've done all you're doing and you're still out here doing it. Um, and to get asked advice on things on how they could hope to have a career as long as mine and, and perform at a high level for, for decades to come. Mm, yeah, that's great. That's, yeah, I, I don't think people realize what um, what it, how intense that would be at that age. I know, um, you know, I was thinking about my first commanding officer was probably forty five years old. On, on on and he was he was an 06, mm-hmm. uh, you know, on a submarine, and he was the old man. I mean, you know, yeah. you're you're older than that. And I always thought we always thought of him <laughs> as the old man, right? Right. <laughs> you're older than, and yeah. and you weren't just sitting in a submarine drinking coffee, you were jumping out of planes and running across the ground and I mean, all this crazy stuff, which yeah. is getting highly, shot at <laughs> getting yeah, highly <laughs> physical. And I, I think you, you, you nailed it is that, and I think for our listeners, those of you who are, are more seasoned, if you will, is that we start, we start have to use our, our brains and our experience and more, exactly. and we can help the younger people in our organization just through the wisdom that we've gained through, you know, hard knocks and, you know, what we put our body through, what we put our minds through, what we've done, and we can help others through that. So I think you, sounds like you had that kind of an experience too. You're probably a bit of a mentor to people. Yeah. And looked well, up to you. There, there's an old saying that I first heard in medicine, but it really applies to everything. And that's good decisions come from wisdom and wisdom comes from bad decisions. Yes. So, you know, yeah. you're, you're 19, 20 years old, making bad decisions and you have those aha moments. Wow. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> And years later, those are, those are the, and I, I, I tell my kids this, I said, some of life's most important and most valuable lessons are the painful ones or yeah. the ones that just scare the hell out of you. That yeah. you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm not going to do that again. That's, yeah. that, that's going to stick with me. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No, we, it's funny because we try to, as, as, as humans, we try to take things easy. We don't want challenges or problems or going through those tough things, tough times or those or making mistakes. But it's through those that we actually became become better at what we do, better at life, better at having withstood those difficult moments or having made mistakes. Um, we, you know, in, in my my latest book, I talk a little bit about the, the power of failure and why you know failure is such a great and important mm. teaching tool because it's so emotional, right? Sure that you'll, yep. you'll never forget it. And um, one of the things they did really well for us when I was going through my training was that they put us in situations where there was controlled failure. So you had the chance to have that emotional connection with, oh, don't ever do that because that's really bad, you know. Yeah. And I think those are great for for us as we as we age, as we um, you know grow up through our organization. So mm-hmm. so let's let's talk about like our bodies, right? I mean, especially a, a male body as we mm-hmm. age, right? What happens? I mean, in a healthy body, what mm-hmm. happens? What with us to where it's it's more difficult as we get older? So great question. Just just from the passage of time, whether you're living properly or not, uh, eating right, exercising, doing all the right things, um, just because of aging, you are going to have some effects on the body. You don't heal as fast. You mm. don't heal as efficiently. Um, a lot of your connective tissues lose their elasticity over time. Mm-hmm. There is some stiffening of your blood vessels 
regardless of you know watching your your sugar and your cholesterol and everything else to a degree there is going to be some stiffening of your vessels which is going to uh, affect you um the hormones that you produce that are tend to be more beneficial to doing things like working out and staying in tip top shape their production uh, drops off as you get older. And also the receptors on our cells that help those hormones activate the cells to do the work, those receptors diminish in number and become resistant to the action of those hormones. So metabolically, we change. You know, it's, it's why it becomes easier to put on fat, a mm. little bit harder to put on muscle, a little bit harder to lose fat when we want to. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, used to be you could just eat junk food for weeks on end. Right. Right. And your weight wouldn't fluctuate. And now you drive past a dairy queen and you put on three pounds. I mean, it's <laughs> a bit of an exaggeration, but not much. So there, there are some changes. And I talk about that in depth in the chapter on aging. These are the things that you need to be mindful of. And, and none of these things are mission stoppers. And none of these things are excuse to just let it happen. You just need to be aware of them. So what does that mean? It need, means I need to be a little bit more attentive to the food that I put into my body. I need mm. to be a little bit more attentive to things like getting proper rest and recovery and getting enough water and uh, stretching and warming up and recognizing when something's not feeling quite right. And I mm. need to, I need to cease that exercise or modify that exercise, you know, toughening, toughening through it. Like we did in our twenties and, and even our thirties just isn't the answer anymore. Mm. So you have to approach things differently because aging is a real thing, but I, I say all the time and, and people, uh, I, I get this quoted back to me as, as one of the lines in the book that people really appreciate. The passage of time is inevitable, but the effects of aging are highly variable. They're real mm. and undeniable, but they're highly variable. And you, know, you can, you see this all the time. You see, you know, mug shots of people and it says, you know, this Florida man, uh, 42 year old Florida man, uh, sorry to pick on Florida, but right. a 40, 42 year old Florida man arrested. And you look at the picture, he looks 72. Right. 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 Uh, and, and then you see, you know, some, some of these guys, you know, professional athletes, hall of famers coming back to get recognized and put into the hall of fame. And they still look amazing. They still look yeah. like they did in their prime. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with how you take care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. That's, that's really important. You know, it's funny because I really relate to that uh, as far as when I was younger, I could eat anything. I wouldn't even think twice about, you know, ordering a pizza and finishing off most of it myself, right? Yeah. With, a, with a Mountain Dew next to it, right? Not even yeah. think twice and, and have no effect. Now, if I have two slices of pizza, I feel like bloated and I'm like, oh, I got to go right. take a you know, yeah, it's, that's, it's I really can remember bad. in my 20s, like you say, eating pizza and thinking to myself, what? It's... it's it's meat, it's cheese, right? So it's, it's protein. There's right. some, there's some crust here. That's some carbs. There's tomato sauce that counts as a vegetable. This is a balanced meal altogether. Right. You know, right. and like you say, I'd, I'd knock off a whole pizza in my younger days. And now, you know, two, two slices, you know, thank, thank goodness for, for cauliflower pizza crust. I don't know what I would do without it. <laughs> well, that's good to hear because we that's what we're using at our house as well. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so that's good. Interesting that you've you've found that actually it's pretty good. Yeah. So there's even there's even a local pizza place just down the road. We have a Firo's pizza that uh, you can get any of their amazing pizzas and you can get it on a cauliflower crust. And their cauliflower crust, I don't know what they do to it. I maybe they're lying to me, but I can't taste the difference. Really? Oh yeah. wow. Okay, <laughs> that's good. We're we've gotten used to one brand. It's not bad, but you definitely can tell it's not real. You know, yeah, real, real <laughs> dog. So, <laughs> so, um, so you talk about in the book this idea of a warrior athlete. What do you mean by that? Um, I can't. Kind of came to the realization on my own, and and I illustrated in the book that if there's two ways that most people tend to approach health and fitness, either as a chore, mm. like uh, the you know yeah, the, yeah. the Robert Downey Jr. eye roll, uh, I gotta go, I gotta go do this, <laughs> or as a hobby. It's, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of dabbling in fitness. Hey, you know, it's, it's, I uh, enjoy it. Yeah. I'm getting my steps in I'm you know, it's, but not, they're not really serious and committed to it. That's not how a warrior lives his or her life. A warrior is committed to the mission at hand and the mission at mm -hmm. hand for a warrior is to be a better version of yourself each and every day than you were the day before. I like this. 
And if you approach, approach it from that angle, you become voracious about your fitness. You become voracious about your wellness that you you're anxious. You're chomping at the bit to get, get in the gym. If something happens and you have uh, a day of meetings and you can't get to the gym, you start to get really upset and, and, and you look, well, maybe, you know what I can, I can still go tonight after work, you know, because, because it starts to mean so much to you, almost like an obsession, but a healthy obsession. Mm. And, and the, the term, warrior hyphen athlete can really apply to anything in your life. You know, you can be a warrior hyphen entrepreneur, a warrior hyphen teacher, a warrior hyphen dad. It, but that just means that you're making it a priority in your life, mm. something that you are going to just totally fold yourself into and focus on. And, uh, and that's going to be your number one priority. That's going to be your tip of the spear. And if you do that, it really changes your outlook on it. It's, it's, it ceases to be a chore that you, oh, I got to drag myself in there. And also, you know, if it's, if it's a hobby, as soon as it's not fun, yeah. you either find yeah. an excuse or you say, well, you know, I, I played golf or I went bowling and you know, that was, I was moving. So that was, yeah, I, I had a, I had a beer in between every couple frames, but I was moving around. So that's kind of like exercise. You, you start to make excuses and it's uh, you're just not going to be as focused. So what you're saying is this idea of being a warrior athlete or warrior anything really is a mindset issue. Like you're, this totally. is, this is mission. This is mission critical. And I'm going to make yes. sure this is a priority. That's an excellent yeah. mission. Critical is an excellent way to put it. Excellent way but to put it. It's interesting because, you know, I've been, I've, I've been pretty active in the weight room for 10 years now. And, and I, and it's funny because every, every new year's, it's always this new year's resolution and everybody starts heading to the gym. I hate, I hate, I call that. January, uh, the, the first six weeks of every year, uh, yeah. is I, I call that the amateur time that the, the people go to the gym who basically just get in your way. Yeah. And I, I, I try not to be annoyed because I know a small percentage of them will last yeah. and I know they're trying. Um, but I, I actually, I abhor new year, new year's resolutions or something I hate <laughs> and bucket <laughs> bucket lists are another thing that I hate. Oh, um, for, we for, share, for we whole, share that. We yeah, share that yeah. In <laughs> yeah. Cause to me, bucket list is things you're just making excuses for not doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. yeah New year's resoluters is, it's, it's uh, you know, make a lifestyle change, make a lifestyle change in, in April. It, it doesn't, you don't have to wait for the new year to, you know, this whole new year, new you thing. These are arbitrary things on a calendar. If we're using the Sumerian calendar or the Aztec calendar, you'd be doing that at a totally different time of year. So why does it have to be January? Yeah. Why, why not start tomorrow and keep going? You know, exactly. Yeah. 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 Cause the, the best time to do anything is 10 years ago. The second right. best time is right now. And the worst time is later. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's great. I like the, I like the idea that it's a mindset and it's, it's less about it's even, it, it's just, you make it a priority that it's, it's mission. It, it lies, we are saying mission critical. You make it a priority because, you know, this is important for, for you, for you, for you now and for the future. So I think that's idea that, that idea of it being mindset is really important. So um, one of the things you talk about is, is reaching peak physical activity in the second half of, of life for, for a man. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What, how do we do that? If I had to sum it down into one thing and one thing only, it's, it's, uh, well, actually, and I'm going to give you two things. Uh, one is consistency over time equals results, right? So you're showing up, you're putting in the reps, you're putting in that, that 45 minutes to an hour and a half in the gym, whether that's four times a week, three times a week, four times a week, five times a week, but you're doing it. You're consistently doing it weekend. You're not taking two weeks off and then going in for three days and then taking a week off. You're doing it. Right. So, so you, consistency over time will equal results. And then the other thing is progress over perfection. So don't, mm. don't go in there. Don't be disappointed when uh, you get back into it and you feel like you really worked out hard for a week or two weeks and you step on the scale and the needle hasn't moved yeah. or uh, you actually go in one day and the amount of weight that you can deadlift is less than it was two weeks ago. That's fine. You know, you're going to have, a, you're going to have some ups and downs in there, but as long as you're consistent over time, and as long as you have an eye towards 
pro, uh, progress, not perfection. You know, I'm not going to go in, 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 a, in a week, I'm not going to get in shape. I always tell people, you know, when we were younger, the amount of time that it took you to get out of shape was the time that it was going to take you to get back in shape. So if you'd been sloughing off for right. six months, it sure. was going to take six months to get back into it. As we age, you double that. Yeah. Now, now I'm not telling somebody, oh, I haven't seriously been in the gym in five years. You're telling me it's going to take 10 years to get in shape. No, it's going to take a while to get to where you feel comfortable with it. Um, and you just need to be aware of that, that it's not going to, you didn't get out of shape overnight. So you're not going to get in shape overnight. And you just, you have to accept that. And the, uh, the path to injury is paved with shortcuts. So if you try to take shortcuts, you're just going to end up hurt. And then, then you're going to have to take time out, right? You're, then yeah. you're going to say, yeah. now I'm sidelined for a month because yeah. I tried to take shortcuts and I hurt myself. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, 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 that's a big thing. And I think as older, as an older lifter, as an older runner, that's um, injury is always just something that's around the corner. So I, I think that's a yeah. big part of, 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 of doing it. Well, as you know, you wrote the book on it, but uh, rest and recovery is really important. It's much more important as you, the older you get that you don't, you know, I was, I was pushing in seven days a week working out and now I only do five days a week and I actually give my body two days to just sort of not do anything. And I found it, I can, I have more, I gain more, I've gained more. I, I have less injuries. I think that rest and recovery time is, at least for me, I found that to be really important as I've gotten older. And it's and often uh, in our generation, I think especially often neglected because that's not what we were taught, right? We, we were right. taught right. It, you, you get progress by working out, not by resting. And that's right. why I put a whole chapter on recovery in the book. And I talk about how important it is and active recovery versus passive recovery and doing what we call deloads why it's important to do that. And, and you really will see that that's when you make your big improvements when that that's when your body pivots, kind of clicks it into another gear. And then you come back and you're stronger and your endurance is better than it was previously. Yeah, that's good. That's really important. Um, so, so the, you talk about two different things. One is uh, longevity uh, and the other one is uh, performance optimization. So there's two things that you talk about. How are these achieved and how are they related at this age as you get older? Uh, performance optimization is what we oftentimes ha have been striving for our ent entire lives. So something is coming up that you're getting ready for. Like, you know, you're in the military, you're getting in shape to go to a school or you're getting in shape for a deployment uh, you know, getting in shape, you know, for some type of training event, uh, that that's coming up, uh, in civilian life, you're getting in shape for that triathlon or that 10 K or a marathon. So that's performance optimization. Performance optimization means, all right, I'm going to do pretty intense training with the goal of peaking right mm -hmm. as I'm entering this yeah. event. Yeah. And the, 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 the example I give in the book, and I think it's one of the best examples out there is for, uh, for in combat sports. So whether we're talking about boxers, uh, wrestlers, uh, MMA fighters, you know, they go through a fight camp and they're, they're doing a couple things. They're cutting weight, um, to make weight for that fight, but they're also optimizing their performance and they want to be peaking right as they go in there. But what oftentimes mm -hmm. happens, and you'll hear MMA fighters talk about this all the time is that most of them in their career have never done a professional fight without some kind of injury. Mm. And, it, and it's oftentimes secondary to that because they have ramped up their training to the point. And remember the path to shortcuts is, is, or the path to injury is paved with shortcuts, right? So it's, they, they're essentially almost taking shortcuts and they end up injured. Um, now, as we get older, we start to realize that longevity is a little bit more important because who wants to be 55 years old and broken with so many chronic injuries that now you can't do any of the things that you enjoy. You can't right. perform at any level. So you need to have an eye. I wish somebody would have told me at age 20 <laughs> to have an eye on longevity. And, you know, yeah. certainly a, a lot of the chronic injuries that I have now, I would not have, but now I don't ever, I don't ever go into the gym saying, you know, I, I had to do a photo shoot for the back cover of my book. I didn't change anything about the way I was working, working out in the, in the weeks leading up to that. Um, I didn't, I didn't make any big dietary changes. I didn't try to starve myself. Uh, 
I'm, I'm said, I'm going to look the way that I'm going to look. And it's going to be an honest reflection of how fit I am for the people that read the book. And if, if they want to uh, embrace this same lifestyle, I always have an eye towards longevity, which means I'm consistent over time to get those results, the prog progress over perfection formula, but never pushing it so hard that I'm going to risk injury. Now, if I have a jujitsu competition, I will increase the number of days per week that I'm rolling with people for jujitsu. And that's to increase me, increase my abilities or enhance my abilities technically and tactically when it comes to that particular combat sport. Um, I also might do a, a little bit more endurance work and that's, uh, that's not so much a performance optimization as it is just a change to rather than have everything evenly represented in my fitness, I know that going into that match uh, endurance is going to be a little bit more important than how much I can than strength and how much I can deadlift. Mm, or, right. Right. So, okay. so I'll just, I'll just, I'll make some modifications, but all in all, I don't do anything radical. I'm never radically shifting anything in my lifestyle because of some arbitrary deadline of something coming coming up that I just, I absolutely have to be this weight or look this way or, or have this amount of strength or be this fast on this date. I just don't do that. Mm. Um, and I think people will find that if, if you look at it from that point of view, 10 years down the road, not, not only are you going to, when it does come time that you need performance, you're less likely to be injured, more likely to have made steady progress over the past year, six months, whatever it might be. And then you're also going to have the benefit of longevity. So I think if you concentrate on longevity, you get both. Whereas mm -hmm. if you concentrate on performance, you're going to get performance a couple of times, and then you're going to have neither because mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to perform in a pinch and you're going to be so wrecked. You're going to lose longevity. And, and I have, um, I have friends that I served with on active duty that uh, are, and I have a hundred percent VA disability rating from, from all of my injuries. I know guys who are just uh, for lack of a better word, a train wreck hmm. because they were guys that were, you know, you know, guys that uh, I got to push. I'm going to scuba school. I got to push myself. I'm going to best ranger competition. I got to push myself. I'm going to Delta selection. I got to push myself. You know, and every time I would run into these guys all the time, it's like, Hey, what are you doing? I, oh, I went out and did a 10 mile ruck run today with 65 pounds. I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for this. I want to go do that. Always pushing themselves. And, and I see these guys now and uh, they're broken. And, mm. and a lot of it has to do with that. You know, they, they sacrifice themselves at the altar of, of performance optimization for, for decades. You know, it's funny because this book is about, you know, what to do over 40, but it sounds like some of the things that you, some of the mistakes you make early in your life can hurt your ability to have that longevity as well. Yeah. Uh, my oldest son is 20 and I'm going to make him read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and he's not in the military, uh, but he does work out a lot and he's, and he's big into fitness. And I, I want him to have the benefit. I don't, I don't want him to have the internal scars at my age that I have. I want him to have the benefit of my wisdom and experience and, and have an eye towards longevity at an early age. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about, um, as you were talking about this, I was thinking about like the analogy of a aircraft carrier, right? It doesn't, it doesn't accelerate fast, doesn't slow down fast, doesn't turn fast, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got you've to you've, you've keep on it and stay on it to, to, to get it to where you want it to go versus, you know, maybe a smaller ship that, that accelerates fast, you know, you can turn it on a dime and all this sort of thing. So it's, it's a matter of, as you get older, you're, you're more the aircraft carrier that you've got to yeah. guide that thing <laughs> versus, you know, and you have to anticipate where it's going and you've got to stay on that for some length of time mm -hmm. to, to get to the result versus trying to just, you know, move, you know, steer it in one direction, move quickly. So you've got to kind of do it gradually if you want to get to where you're trying to go to. That's a perfect analogy. That's, that's really exactly what it's like. Yeah. Wow. So if you if you look at I mean the, the challenge the problem I have with and I've had as an older uh, guy trying to stay in shape is that there's so much garbage out there right as far as um, what you should be doing whether it's diet whether it's exercise what I mean you you come from a really interesting perspective you have the medical background you have the uh, the you've been an athlete your whole life I and mean, essentially being doing what you do you have to be highly athletic. And now you're moving into a different stage in your life. So 
from your observation, what are the kind of optimum uh, diet, exercise kind of routine? What work works? What works best for men for that longevity piece, as you mentioned, and and the occasional performance piece? Great question. Um, if I had to give this as an elevator pitch, because yeah. there, if we get if we get down in the weeds to talk about diet, there yeah. are. There's so many conflicting opinions out there, and everybody, every different camp has data to show that their way works. Right, right. right. So I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm curious to know your, you know, what's your elevator pitch? Because I, <laughs> I, I, I'm hopeful that it's, I'm doing something similar. <laughs> my my elevator pitch is: if it comes in a can, comes in a box, you got it in the freezer section, or somebody handed it to you through your car window, that's not what you should be eating. Ah, I like it. That's the easy, that's the easiest thing. If, if, if lightning strikes me down right now and somebody takes that and incorporates that into their life, that's probably the 80% solution right there. So this. beyond counting calories, counting carbs, uh, anything, anything like that, you eliminate the processed food, el eliminate all, all the stuff that, mm -hmm. because processed food is, uh, preservatives, sodium, fat, bad cholesterol, all the things in Western diet that we don't need that are damaging us uh, are in all of those things that I described. Okay. So if you do nothing else, do that now. And, and I talk in my chapter, when I talk about nutrition, that I'm not a fan of what we call exclusionary diets. Mm. And, and what I don't mean by that, you know, I, you know, people might say, well, but Mike, you just, you just said to exclude some things from our diet. Those are processed foods. I'm talking yeah. about excluding processed foods. I'm not talking about excluding food groups, right? So people, okay, I'm going to exclude carbs. It, been there, done that. I, I've, I've tried it. I talk about it in the book. You can see, did it work for me on a short period of time? Sure. Is it sustainable over time? Probably not. Does, does it have problems that go with it? Absolutely. It does. You know, uh, excluding all animal products. There are problems with that. Excluding plant products and only eating meat. Problems with that. Okay. Not only in keeping it up, but, but long-term health, short and long-term health effects. So I don't believe in exclusionary diets. Um, I won't get into the weeds. I, I talk about specific intake of, of you know, uh, how much protein uh, I recommend as a baseline, how many, how much carbs and how much healthy fat I recommend as a baseline. But suffice it to say, for the purpose of our conversation right now, just eliminate the processed foods, you mm. know, try to eat stuff as, as close to the source as possible. Get, uh, you know, healthy poultry, you know, lean turkey, chicken breasts without the skin, healthy fish. Uh, like salmon, uh, those are great sources of protein. Green leafy vegetables, your plate should have a lot of colors on it, right? I, I love having mixed vegetables. I've, I have a, a newfound uh, joy in eating vegetables in my in my 50s that I, that I never had in my younger years. And then uh, watch out for carbs. Like, yeah. you know, things like bread and pasta should yeah. be one, very, very rare and once, once in a while things. And, uh, you know, certainly fried foods and fried potatoes in particular are not really good for you though they are delicious right um so look at it look at it that way i'll have to uh, edit that part out of the video where, where you, <laughs> no french fries come on <laughs> yeah, i i i occasionally eat french fries but it's not it's certainly not a daily thing or even a weekly yeah. thing you know it's uh i i had some uh some chick-fil-a waffle fries oh, uh, last last weekend and i think that was the first time in months that i'd had any um but they're good they, they are good. You just shouldn't, shouldn't eat them all the time. When it comes I like what you say, I've heard this expression too, that, the, you know, if you're going into a supermarket, you stay on the outer aisles, right? Cause that's typically your, that's true. Your yeah. non-processed foods and your, so you're typically your, your vegetables, your, your meats, your fish, and then you've got your dairy, but then there's no, you know, you, you've eliminated some of the processed foods. If you do that, you spend more time on you the know, outer aisle. I yeah. had never thought of it that way, but you're, yeah, you're hundred percent correct. Cause actually if you, like the, the HEB where I live, you come in and you're immediately in fruits and vegetables, right? Yeah. Although if you fall, you have to, you have to go, now you have to go through the bakery section. Oh, see, so that's, that's the problem. That's, yeah, that's a little dicey. But then you go into the, uh, into the butcher counter right after that. Yeah. And then, uh, and then you do have dairy on the backside there. And then that takes you right into, uh, that takes you right into fruit juice, which a little bit processed, but then, then you pick up your toilet paper, your paper towels on the way out and you're pretty much good. And you yeah. kind of, like you say, you avoided all that stuff in the middle there. So yeah, that is a good way to, and it's only a, a short, de a short detour, uh, a little, a little, a uh, little jog to your left there to get some wine. Uh, as oh yeah. 
getting out of the butcher area too. So yeah, that's, that's actually a pretty good philosophy. I'll have to share that with people. All that's right. Good. Let's put that in your next book. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, when it, and when it comes, what I was going to say, when it, when it comes to the elevator pitch, when it comes to exercise is just be well-rounded. Mm. So, you know, don't, it, don't do it just because it's, you know, it's fun. Uh, if it seems too easy, then it probably is too easy and you, and you need to be well-rounded and, and the way I break that down, I, I have what I call my six pillars of fitness, which is strength, endurance, power, which is slightly different than strength, flexibility, mobility, and durability. So you need to be working on all those things. And I go into detail in, in describing those in the book, but basically it just means you need to be doing a lot of, a lot of movements, uh, and a lot of, I, I like a lot of single limb movements, a lot of dumbbell and kettlebell stuff, because that works your durability, works your stabilization muscles, also works your mobility. Um, sometimes you need to be working at high intensity and getting your heart rate up. And other times you need to be at lower intensity and maybe lifting heavier weights for a shorter amount of reps. But I, I, I can't overstate enough, uh, or I can't, there, there's no way that, that I can, uh, overemphasize the value on a fitness coach, at least in the beginning, if this is something mm. that's new to you. And I mm. tried in my younger days, you know, buying various health and fitness books and, you know, they give you, you know, day to day with diagrams of all the exercise and none of those ever lasted for me, which is why I avoided it in the fitness chapter of my book. And I just, I go over my pillars of fitness. I describe them. I describe how to approach, you know, determining your resting heart rate, your max heart rate and your zones uh, and then how to approach fitness. And I give an example of a week on kind of how I break it down, not by individual exercises necessarily, but by what I'm working on on those specific days. That makes sense. This is, this is going to be, this is a great book. I mean, I really do think that, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, how do I say this? There's a lot of clickbait stuff out there where people are trying to sell a <laughs> diet plan or an exercise plan or what have you. I think, what I really liked about what you're doing, or what I like about what you're doing is that you've, you know, you, you've been in the trenches, you have the experience, you're now <clears throat> moving, transitioning to, you know, in your 50s, and you're giving us advice based on the experience. And of course, you're a medical doctor as well, so you understand this stuff as well. So you're giving us advice that we can actually use because you've used it, you understand it, and, uh, and you've practiced it. And I think that's for me, you know, like I do a lot of, you know, leadership training, leadership, uh, writing leadership books. Well, mm -hmm. the reason you can follow me and trust me on my leadership ideas, because I've done, I've been leading people for 30 years, right? right? You've been, you've been taking care of your body for 30 plus years uh, in very, very tough uh, uh, situations. And, and I think your advice is going to be better than somebody just trying to get clicks and trying to sell a, you know, a gum road book or what have you, you know, I think you're, 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 I think this is a this is a really really valuable book. It's really important. It's something that I personally am very much interested in because I have seen the changes that's happened to me over the years, and I've been trying to keep up with it. And it's 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 difficult. It's hard. Um, it and I think there's a lot of garbage out there. And I think it's trying to find something that is pure, that is based on science, but but it's also based on experience. And I think this is going to be a valuable book for a lot of people. So tell us a little bit about how do we get hold, how do we find the book? How do we find out more about you? Um, what's what's uh, where do we go for that? Uh, so the book is available on Amazon. Uh, that seems to be where most people are getting it. You can also get it on Goodreads. Uh, it's available at BarnesandNoble.com. It's not uh, that I know of. It's not physically in any Barnes and Noble stores, mm -hmm. um, although mm -hmm. it is available on their website. You can look it up either under my name or under the book's title. Um, you can follow me on, uh, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Mike Simpson, D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. I, -S 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 I uh, also have a website, which is Graybeard Performance. Graybeard Performance is the life and lifestyle brand that I started, which really kind of snowballed into what, into the book <laughs> because of uh, things that I was already doing with that. So that's life and lifestyle brand for warrior athletes, uh, uh, age 40 and over, uh, I have a line of supplements that, that I'm continuing to build on. I also s uh, sell uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, geese and rash guards and fight gear uh, and recently expanded to an apparel line as well. So that, that's available on the website now also. And of course, Graybeard Performance also has its own uh, Instagram account as well. Okay. Sounds good. Graybeard Performance. I like the name of that. Uh, your beard doesn't look that gray though. 
everybody always says that. So it doesn't come across, especially <laughs> when I'm in video conferences. I got this, this is gray down in here. And then over here on the sides, it's pretty gray, but I, okay. I couldn't call it, I couldn't call it red gray ish beard performance or red beard with a little <laughs> bit of gray performance. You know, I, I use the term gray beard just because it's a, it's a term that we we've used, especially yeah. in the operator community for a long time, you know, you know, yeah. us talking about us older guys, us gray beards, you know, and yeah. uh, it's the, you know, even at age uh, that, that same deployment that I was talking about at age 48, um, gosh, that was only, uh, you know, uh, that was only seven, eight years ago now. And uh, I had pretty much no gray in my beard at that time. It was a, it was a bright red beard at the time, but, but I was still referred to by the young Rangers as a gray beard. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, that's where it came from. Well, that's good. I am a gray beard. So uh, I'm, it's, <laughs> it's perfect. It's a perfect, uh, company for me to follow and uh, look, take a look at your products. So, so that's great. Well, I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing all this. I really think as leaders, one of the things we have to do is, is maintain our physical health so that we can be strong for the people that depend on us. So I think taking care of yourself physically is a really important part of that diet, exercise, sleep is really critical. So if you want to be a high performing leader, you've got to have a body that's going to be there for you. And I think this book I think you help us uh, understand how to do this as we get older, especially as men, as we get older, how do we do that? How do we maintain that? How do we do that for the long term? So Mike, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing you know, all your insight. And I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the book a lot more going forward. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate being here. And if, if I can leave your audience with one takeaway, especially since you know your, your, your show is uh, focused on leadership, I encourage people to remember that you can you can manage and you can direct from the rear, but you can only lead from the front by definition. So, and in order to lead from the front, you, you have to take care of yourself physically. No, that's great. I really appreciate that. That's great insight. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Till next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Mm -hmm.